Great. So, uh, Jim, just so you're aware, we are live on YouTube now. Okay. Um, and for those watching on YouTube, thank you for being here with us tonight. Um, and just know that we will start the presentation right at seven o'clock. So we've got about another minute. Okay, hey, well, we are right at seven o'clock, so let's dive in. Uh, my name is Caroline Hughes. I'm a biologist at the Loon Preservation Committee. Thank you for joining us for another summer nature talk. Um, for those of you who have watched our talks before, you probably um, are familiar with LPC, but for those that are new, I just wanna give a little bit of background information on our organization. Uh, so we were founded in 1975 in response to a noticeable and dramatic decline in New Hampshire's common loon population um, and really the founding principle behind LPC was that if human actions had contributed to those declines and it seemed uh, very likely that they had, then human actions could also help to uh, reverse those declines and bring our loon population back. And so since 1975, LPC staff and volunteers have been working really hard to restore New Hampshire's loon population. And we have a four-pronged approach. Uh, we do population monitoring so that we can keep an eye on how our loons are doing. We do management, including floating nest rafts, floating signs, working with uh, water level operators um, and, and several other management strategies designed to help you succeed. We do research into the problems that affect loon survival and reproduction. And then we also try to educate the public. And so our Summer Nature Talk series is really designed to help educate folks about the natural world in general and loon specifically. Um, and so tonight we're really lucky to have a loon specific talk. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I do wanna talk a little bit about how this program is going to run um, in terms of the Q&A session, because I'm sure folks will have lots of questions. Um, we found that it works best if folks put their questions into the chat as the presentation is going. And then when we get to the end, I will take the questions from the chat and relay them to our presenters. Um, and so tonight we are so lucky to have Jim Farouk with us. Jim is a biologist and a biology professor at St. Joseph's College in Maine. Um, and he has worked with loons for nearly 30 years. In that time, he has done research on many different aspects of loon biology and behavior. And he has recently published a book, uh, Loon Lessons, Uncommon Encounters with the Great Northern Diver that details some of the things that he's learned along the way. Um, this is a book that you can purchase in the LPC gift shop or on our uh, website at loon.org, and you can buy it in lots of other uh, places that books are sold as well. So Jim, we're so excited to have you here with us tonight. I'm uh, really excited to hear what you have to say, and whenever you're ready, please do take it over. Okay, sounds good. All right, well, good evening, everybody. I'm assuming it's raining wherever you are, and if you're a loon, you're probably waterproof and you're tight, feathers, you're zipped, and you're comfortable. Uh, rest of us, uh, we're, we're in a shelter uh, enjoying ourselves. So again, thank you for joining tonight, this evening. Uh, what I have in store for us is to tell you a little bit about the book that I wrote, and I'm gonna provide some background on myself. I'll tell a few stories from the book. I'm actually gonna read just a couple paragraphs from the book almost as if we were like at a library at a book event. And then I'll kind of go over some of the findings and my approach 
to the book I'll share with you as well. So that's, that's kind of some introduction to just get us going into this. And I got interested in loons accidentally. I had a college roommate, Dave Evers. This is back in 1980, so 40 years ago. And Dave was charged with trying to figure out a way to catch common loons so we can put colored leg bands on and we can study their fate. This was part of his master's thesis at Western Michigan University. And because I was a friend of Dave's, I was flying in California. I flew to Michigan to help him catch loons. And these are some photos from some early years of us going out on the water, trying to catch loons, for example. Uh, we would put colored leg bands on. This allowed researchers to study them over decades, for example, and kind of answering some really basic questions, like do loons stay with the same pair member year after year? How long do loons live? If they switch partners, how far do they go to and before they find another territory, for example? And then whenever you have a loon in your hand, as a scientist, you're trying to gather as much data as you can. And this took me a little while to get comfortable. So you know, we might hold a loon for 20 to 25 minutes. And a little bit in my early, early inexperienced years, I just wanted to weigh the bird, ban it, let it, let it go in five minutes, like three minutes. I just felt that like many of us, when you hold the loon, it's just like this sacred animal. And you feel like uh, you're, you're waking it up from its sleep on the lake and you just wanna treat it with, with such great respect that it deserves. But over time, you, you relax, the loon's fine, the loon calms down. So we took bill measurements, leg measurements, body measurements. This is us measuring the wing, looking at the length, for example, surface area, and weighing the bird in the early days. And I really started full-time on my PhD looking at loon behavioral ecology in 1993. And one of the things that I did for my research was I painted white stripes at the base of the bill. So this allowed me to tell males from females. I put two stripes on males, one on females. So even though these individuals were banded, we all know if you're looking at a loon on a lake, it's like, and you're looking at the pair, but which is the male, which is the female? And you can't always see those bands because the lakes are underwater. So this was a modification that really helped me confidently know parental roles, how much does it ride on the back of the male, the chicks? And um, during incubation, who's exchanging roles, for example? So this was something that was uh, very useful in terms of learning about loons. Now, a little background on myself is I've started this, this process of understanding loons in 1993. So I've been at it for 28 years. And I've had the distinct privilege to work across North America. And so this is a map of North America and it shows you the number of field seasons I was in those locations. A field season might be a week in one location, for example, in Nevada during migration, or it might be three months or four months long, for example. And it would not always be myself, but I'd have assistants and other biologists who would help me gather data. So just starting in the upper Midwest, kind of which is my roots, I spent three seasons in Michigan, three in Wisconsin and six in Minnesota, for, for a total of 12 field seasons. I spent three field seasons in Saskatchewan, two in Alaska, three in Washington State, two in Nevada, two in California, seven off the coast of Louisiana, five on a reservoir in South Carolina for the winter, and six along the coast of Maine. So altogether, you'll see that adds up more than 28, which means I had two concurrent research studies going on at the same time. And so it's been a, just a wonderful journey for me to learn about these birds. We're all mesmerized by loons. You know, we're here, we're on this program because you love loons. Uh, who doesn't, right? They're just remarkably awesome birds and a real privilege to be able to study them and learn about them. Okay, so that's enough of my background. Now let's just tell a couple of stories that might be a little atypical for those of us in New England. So this is a shot off the Louisiana coast in the Gulf of Mexico. These are two loons in kind of the coastal estuary and then two cormorants in the upper right. And I just thought that juxtaposition of loons and cormorants off the, in, the, in the ocean, off the coast of Louisiana. But here you see a warning sign, anchor or dredging, gas pipeline crossing below. Uh, there's lots of oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. And that really surprised me when I was down there doing research on loons, just how many oil platforms there are scattered across the Gulf of Mexico. 
Now, I went down there December, January, February, and March, leaving the cold climes of Maine and New England. And I got a chance to see birds every day, such as brown pelicans and spoonbills and black skimmers, which is something atypical for us in New England, and just a treat for me to be able to see daily. I would oftentimes we see American alligators. And then this is us tracking some loons in the Gulf of Mexico. And so what a privilege it was to be down there investigating loon behavior. So I've got a picture here for you and just wondering if any of you can look at this picture and guess where it's from. This is the New Orleans skyline. This is Lake Pontchartrain. And we caught some loons out on that water body, you know, over 10 years ago. So when we were down in the Gulf of Mexico, we would do surveys of loons uh, in between years and among years. And what you see here is a fairly typical flock of loons in the winter. This might be one or two or even three in the afternoon. We'd come across a large raft of 20 to 50, sometimes over 100. Uh, one time we, we estimated over 600 loons in one flock. And so most of us are aware of loons being asocial during the breeding season, highly territorial. But yet in the winter time, they will tolerate being around other loons and I think what they're doing is they're feeding on schooling fish and increasing their probability of foraging success by working together, by foraging cooperatively. You're more likely to have success as one fish avoids one loon, it goes into the mouth of the other loon. So this was real exciting to see. Oftentimes we would see pelicans or gannets, another water bird, terns and gulls associate with these flocks of loons. So it's almost as this is this interspecies communication that was taking place in the Gulf of Mexico. And it was a real treat to observe that. So now we're looking at a loon with a crab, which is fairly typical in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, my research suggests that crab is a major food for many loons in coastal Louisiana. And it wasn't too happy because the loon kind of had, was bit by the crab. So we oftentimes we would see this behavior. And then the loon with its large bill would crush off those those uh, pinchers and then swallow the crab, uh, masticating it. So this is really the highlight, dolphins and loons. Every time we were out in the Gulf of Mexico, there was a pod of dolphins that we would experience and see. And sometimes dolphins and loons would be together. And just that juxtaposition is just in itself, probably doesn't need any words to just conjure up emotion in us, right? Seeing a marine cetacean with, with a loon. And I want to tell you a little story that I wrote in chapter, in one of the early chapters, chapter two, just about this experience. So this is just one paragraph. So bear with me as we kind of make our way through it. So I lowered my arm off the front end of the boat, opened my hand underwater with a measuring stick and confirmed what I had suspected. It completely disappeared 18 inches below the surface. How could any visual predator find prey under those conditions? In my more than 30 years as a naturalist, I've had many amazing encounters with wildlife and observed a lot of fascinating behavior. But this story ranks up there as one of my most memorable. So this is when you hear the music. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, we're all excited. We're on the edge of our seats. So in January 2012, I was doing winter loon surveys off the Louisiana coast, and my mind was struggling to comprehend how loons can find food in this environment. They are visual predators, and the murky water must have made it extraordinarily challenging to locate prey. We were in a series of channels dotted with islands when we spotted a bottlenose dolphin. Any dolphin sighting makes for a great day, but this one was acting peculiar. It was swimming towards shore and would then swim back to the middle of the channel and repeat the same maneuver. What was it doing, we were saying to ourselves. We could see ripples of water near shore from fish racing away from the dolphin. It must be pushing the schooling fish to shallow water to increase its foraging odds. That's it, we shouted to each other. Amazing. Then we saw the common loon follow in the wake of the dolphin as it moved toward shore. At first we were skeptical, but the longer we observed, the more certain we were that the loon was consciously swimming back and forth each time in the wake of the dolphin to get any fish it missed. The behavior did not look cooperative by any means. It simply looked like the loon was aware of what the dolphin was trying to accomplish and knew that its chance of catching fish increased when swimming in its wake. Now that was really amazing. So that was some of the interesting things when you're out on a big, large body, body water like the ocean, 
uh, or if you're just out, you see things. And uh, this was one of my highlights from the Gulf of Mexico. I'm just gonna tell you one more story today. And this is one of Walker Lake, Nevada. It's probably less known, less common. And I'm gonna read, read from, uh, from the book as well. I'm just gonna read a few paragraphs and tell you more of the story in a nutshell. But this is a, a high desert lake uh, in the mountains in Nevada. It's about an hour and a half from Reno. So if you look at it, you can see it's mostly dry and xeric environment. And the lake levels have been dropping each decade. And of course, climate change and global warming is not helping this lake at all as well. So lake levels are dropping. Dissolved solids in the lake are increasing. This is a freshwater lake. And there's only one river, the Walker River, that flows into it. And there's no outlet. So imagine simply like a bathtub. And loons would stop at this place during migration and feed. And there's lots of fish, for example, in this lake. That's great food for, for the loons. So we were there to kind of help establish a connection between where these migrating loons bred to see if we can raise awareness about the plight of Walker Lake. So wildlife research involves roving parks and sometimes things do not always go according to plan. Here's a good example. In 1998, Dave Evers and I were at Walker Lake, teaming up with researchers Mike Yates and Mark Fuller from Boise State University, Larry Neal from Nevada Department of Wildlife, and Kevin Keenow from the USGS Service in Wisconsin. Each team was there to do a specific job. Mike and Mark from Boise State were leaders of the project. The team from Nevada had the boats, the drivers, and the expertise to navigate around the lake. The USGS staff and Kevin were responsible for conducting surgeries and implanting the satellite transmitters. And Dave and I were there to catch loons. We all met the third week in April. So we went through introductions and discussed the plan for the next few days. The Boise State team notified the group that the satellite transmitters would, were not in hand, but they would arrive the next day. So we questioned whether to put off going in the boats until the next day when we had the satellite transmitters in hand but strong winds were forecasted each evening. And mind you, this is in the desert, uh, high mountains, winds come down the mountains and it really howls down this lake. This lake is 40 miles long by seven to 10 miles wide. And so the winds can just howl down this lake and which is kind of what I'm talking about. So we talked about our limited options. Dave and I even offered, we were not sure we can catch loons outside of the breeding season. So during the breeding season, it's fairly easy to catch a loon because the adults stay protective of their young, they're on the surface of the water, they're reluctant to dive and you can scoop them up. But on the breeding grounds, there's no paternal instinct. They're not with their young. And so what's to prevent a loon from just diving into water and escaping the net, for example? So we were not even sure we can catch a loon. So we felt, let's just go out and try and see what we could do. And it turned out we were fairly successful. We ended up catching five loons that night. And now we were faced with a decision is what do we do with these loons. So we let two of them go, we remained and kept three of them, but we were thinking that we may not be able to go out, for example, the next nights. And so we had to keep the loons overnight. So Kevin gave him a saline solution and um, we were thinking about just keeping the loons. We ended up keeping them in our hotel rooms. If you can imagine, we put a box, we put a life jacket in the bottom to cushion the loons. And we put the air conditioning units on and we had to wait until the next morning to when the satellite transmitters arrived. So let me just tell you just a little bit more about this paragraph. So I forgot whose idea it was to fill up the bathtub, but we did. And Dave lowered one of the loons into it. The bird did not panic, parentheses, thank goodness, and simply floated there. We posted one person in the bathroom in each room to make sure the loons were safe. Most of us were sleep deprived. Morning could not come fast enough, but our wait was extended because the satellite transmitters did not arrive until 1230. Kevin sanitized the building, prepared it for, their oper for the operations. I appreciated his calm demeanor and professionalism and was more than glad to give the loons to him. So Kevin conducts the surgeries, we release the birds and Mike Yates ended up tracking these birds to Saskatchewan. So this is us going out in a long handle dip net, for example. There's the loon. 
and there's the surgeries. And now here's releasing the loons. So this loon that we caught, several of these loons all flew to Saskatchewan. So it's true, things do not always go according to plan, especially in wildlife research. None of us like the idea of holding those loons for more than 10 hours. But given the information we had, we decided it was best to hang on to them for the night rather than release them. That decision turned out to be the right one because the other nights during our stay were so, so windy, we never did get back on the water. So that just shows you when you have multiple moving parts, you know, things don't always go according to plan. And I've ordered satellite transmitters for my own research. And sometimes you think April 1st, the company says, that's fine, we'll get it to you by April 1st. But sometimes it doesn't always happen that way. And those are, that's just the nature of kind of doing research. So the story could end there, but there's a twist to the story. So move the research to the coast of Louisiana in 2011. And we had some money and we put two satellite transmitters and loons in the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Louisiana. So can you imagine going out at night at random and catching two birds? We do the similar satellite transmitters and we release those birds. So where do those birds off the coast of Louisiana go? Okay, so here's one starting. This is, you can see from a long time ago. It stayed 10 days on a reservoir in Tennessee. It spent 10, 15 days on Lake Michigan, six days around Lake Winnipeg, and arrived on a breeding lake in Saskatchewan 52 days later, 2,309 miles total route. Now, what about the second bird? Well, the second bird remained in the, off the coast of Louisiana. It spent 20 days off the Mississippi coast. Then it went to a reservoir in North Carolina, nine days in Chesapeake Bay, 12 days in Lake Erie, Lake Erie, 10 days in Lake Huron, two to three days in Lake Winnipeg. And then it ended up in Saskatchewan, 2,776 miles. So this is the longest journey of any loon. I, I don't know if we're gonna find another common loon that migrated any further than this individual, but that possibility potential exists. So when we were looking at these data, I remember the loons from Nevada went to Saskatchewan. So we were able to get those coordinates, downloaded them. So this is like 11, 12 years later, 13 years later. And so you're looking at a map where the dotted lines are where we caught the birds in Walker Lake, Nevada. They flew up to Saskatchewan and the dark lines, the undotted ones, you can see where the birds in Louisiana went in Saskatchewan. And you can see, it looks like there's an overlap. So we scaled in on that. And we're looking at a lake called Peter Pond Lake. And the thicker line is the bird from Louisiana. And the thinner line is the bird from Walker Lake, Nevada. And you see, surprisingly, that's the same water body. And if you've ever seen Princess Bride, and if you haven't, it's, a, it's worth seeing it, I guess. But the word inconceivable comes to mind. Like, are you kidding me? 13 years later, we catch two birds in random in Walker Lake. We catch two loons in random in the ocean off the coast of Louisiana. And those birds both, you know, kind of ended up in Walk Peter Pond Lake in Saskatchewan. So this shows you in the same region of the lake. So that's one of my stories and experiences with loons that um, you couldn't have made up. Okay, so in terms of stories, and part of the book is a blend between my experiences and stories that I've had over all of my decades studying loons, and also what new research we found, not just myself, but other researchers, you know, besides Dave Evers, for example, Walter Piper was instrumental in much of this research. Uh, Kevin Keenow at the USGS, for example, Jay Mager, Charlie Walcott, uh, many, many other researchers added to these cool findings. So one of the things that we started is we banded a loon chick in 1989. That chick is still living. So that's over 30 years. We banded an adult in 1992. That bird had to have been at probably at least five years to get a territory or so we've learned now. So that bird is essentially even 36 years old, for example. So we know loons can live past 30 years. Walter Piper probably has the best data set. And, and right now we're looking at most loons live between 20 and 30 years, but it's not a given that 
all loons live past 30 years. It seems 20 to 30 seems to be probably the sweet spot. But of course, as we gather more data, that information may change. And in terms of pair fidelity, you know, do loons mate for life, for example, was something that back in 1988, we were unclear about. Well, now we're confident loons do not mate for life. They have two to three partners per their lifetime. The average partnership lasts about five years. We have some pairs that have stayed together 17 years, for example, but they do switch partners. And usually that's because one adult doesn't come back. So maybe there's a mortality event during migration or during winter, or there's a contest between a younger loon, for example, and the resident loon may lose that contest. So we do know they come back 80, 85% in terms of breeding site fidelity, but what about winter site fidelity? This is something that I've been interested in the last 11 years. I've done most of my research on wintering loons. It's been an absolute joy, treat, to learn something new each and every field season about loons in the winter. And what we found is that loons are remarkably faithful to the winter location. So if you're off Cape Cod, coast of Maine, down by um, you know, South Carolina or the coast of California or the Puget Sound in Washington, loons go back to those same areas, especially adults year after year. And there's a loon, uh, a colleague and I, Darwin and Long, Darwin Long and I banded in 2004 as an adult. That bird was still came back and seen periodically every year and it was still seen in 2020. So we have a bird 16 years from the same site year after year after year. And now what about dive duration and dive depth? This is an area where we can still use some new information, but with, with, with the help of some geolocators and some new technologies, we have some better understanding of loons in terms of their dive depth and duration. We do know they can dive to over 200 feet, you know, likely more and they can stay in the water for three to four minutes. Uh, I suspect it's probably closer to four to five minutes for sure, and can dive probably up to 300 feet or potentially more. So remember, loons dive using their legs, so they're foot propelled, unlike penguins, which are wing propelled, right? And a loon and penguin of the same size probably have equal abilities in terms of how far, how deep they can dive and for how long, for example. Okay, and the largest, largest and heaviest loons in the world. So we have loons from Iceland now, Alaska, Washington. And what is the answer to that question? Well, we find loons in the interior are smaller. Loons in New Hampshire are quite large. And I did not get a chance to update this slide, but Maine loons are slightly larger than New Hampshire. New Hampshire is a close second. So the loons largest in the world are in Maine, is what we've learned. Now I have this slide here, not because I like Star Wars, and, and nor should I make the sound that Darth Vader makes, but there's something potentially sinister about loons. And it, it's always a little unsettling to learn this aspect about loons, but you know they are uber aggressive. And so Dr. Mark Pokris at Tufts University was doing necropsies on loons and saw all these sternal punctures, like these little holes in the sternum of the breastplate of the loon. And was trying to figure out like, why do loons have these and, and who made them, right? And so he took the loon bill, placed it in, and it fit quite well into those holes. So Mark and his colleagues have noticed about half loons have sternal punctures. I believe the numbers like between six and seven, the average number of sternal punctures found on a breastplate of a loon. And what was surprising was that females had just as many punctures as males. And I think that's gonna shake up the loon world a bit because most of us who've observed loons tend to, say, at least in the early days when I was watching loons, I tended to see more male aggressive interactions and less female-female aggressive interactions but we might be missing out on quite a few female, female aggressive interactions as well. And it would be interesting to note, are there any intersexual uh, combatants as well? So far, we don't believe so, but that's a possibility. Okay, so my approach to the loon 
as a biologist, my training, you know, you ask questions, all of us have had similar questions, you know, why the red eye, why the necklace, why the checkered back, uh, the counter shading, the really white belly on loons. So it starts there. And my approach to kind of teasing apart, understanding loon anatomy, loon behavior, is what we call the adaptationist approach. And it says that traits or behaviors that loons exhibit probably are beneficial to their survival or reproduction. And so if you have those traits and they're successful, they will be passed down to the next generation, provided there's like a genetic link right in the DNA for that. And so loons will exhibit those traits. And so over time, we see slight modifications in the loon skeletal system, in loon behavior, for example. So just a little chart for us. If we think of a variation in any trait, melanin might be the type of pigment or how much pigment, the number of spots on a loon, the weight of the loon, uh, the size of the web, uh, the foot, and we can go on and on in this. Normally in science, what we find is a bell-shaped curve. And we realize this with humans. If you look at height and weight and plot that, you can see most of us are average height, average weight, and you have extremes on each end. And so natural selection would be pushing that average either one way or the other, for example, so if it was beneficial to have more melanin or more spots or to, to weigh more or weigh less, we would see selection push things one direction or another. And so that's kind of been my approach to looking at loon behavior throughout this book that I share with you. So if we look at dark feathers, why, why, what's the advantage of dark feathers? Well, melanin is the pigment that is responsible for the dark coloration and it adds rigidity to the feather. So why would rigidity come in play? Well, if you look at a flying bird, this is a northern gannet. And if you look at any of the gulls that you see on the oceans or inland lakes, typically they have black wingtips. And black's gonna be more resistant to wear than a white tip feather. So for loons and, and diving birds, right there, 99% black. And I think the dark feathers add rigidity. And where that comes into play is loons have air sacs. So imagine like little balloons. And in terms of trying to dive to the bottom, those balloons would impede how far you can go. But if you have stiff feathers, you can squeeze those air sacs and you can reduce your neutrality, your specific gravity, and you can sink. So that's what I think is going on. And that's what I talk about in the book in terms of characteristics that we see in loons. So another one I'll share with you is just clutch size. Everybody asks, how many eggs do loons lay? And again, if you look at the bell-shaped curve, almost most loons lay two eggs. There's selection against one egg, and there's probably selection against three eggs. So first, let's look at one egg. If you lay one egg and the other ones lay two, you're, not, you're less likely to, to keep up in terms of how many young hatch each year and how many fledge. Plus you're putting the proverbial, all your eggs in one basket. So if that egg is inviolable or if something happens, that's not a very successful strategy. So I think most one egg clutches result from probably disturbance. So they never get a chance to lay the second egg because again, a predator or some other human disturbance may have prevented them, the female from laying a second egg. Well, we do hear about three egg clutches. Again, highly uncommon. And the reason for that, if we think about it, is selection. Is that if I have three, three young, now I have to feed those three young. And that means I'm busy all the time feeding them and that's less food for me to put on fat prior to migration. So what happens is I'm not in good of condition, for example, because I'm so busy feeding and the young probably don't get as much food because it's distributed among three instead of two individuals. So those young are probably underweight and maybe undernourished. So optimal clutch size suggests for loons that two eggs is the winning strategy. So my approach in this book is not to just spew out facts, but to put those facts right in some kind of context so they make sense. Okay, the last one I'll share with you and we're just about wrapping up here is migration strategy. So we've learned that loons in the Midwest are smaller and the loons in New England are heavier than loons in the Midwest. So let's evaluate that migration strategy. And if we were looking at fuel efficiency in vehicles and you only had X amount of dollars 
X amount of gallons of gas to buy, and you had to go on a long distance trip, right? You're gonna you're gonna pick the Toyota Prius because structure and function go together. It's designed to be streamlined, it's lightweight, it's gonna get 45 miles to the gallon. Now the, the Hummer on the other side of the Humvee is um, it just it's just a different structure. It's just a different vehicle. It's not designed necessarily for long distance. It's designed for rugged terrain. And if you wanted a car for rugged terrain, that would be the one that you would purchase. So I use that analogy with cars and fuel efficiencies because weight is a factor for a migrating individual. If you're gonna go a long distance, carrying extra weight costs extra calories, uh, and extra stress on individuals, for example. So we're really asking ourselves, are long distance migrants lighter than short distance migrants? So are Wisconsin, Minnesota loons smaller than New Hampshire and Maine? So if selection is operating on loons from the upper Midwest for smaller body size, we should see that because smaller body size, you're more successful to travel a long distance and survive than a heavier individual because your cost of transport is so high. You know, maybe an analogy to think about it is, is going for a walk and then putting a 50 pound backpack on and going for a walk. It's like, oh my gosh, that's a lot of work. So what we found, right, is that loons from the Midwest are 35% oftentimes smaller than loons in New England, for example. So females are also in every case smaller than males. So we did find that long distance migrants are selected to be lighter and smaller. So cost of transport is more efficient. So they're the Toyota Prius in New York and New Hampshire loons and those in Maine, New England might be the Humvee. So selection for smaller loons makes sense. Cost of transport, we're going a long way. So now we gotta ask ourselves, what about, for example, short distance migrants? How come loons in New England are larger? It almost seems like they're getting larger. So why, why are they larger? Well, the larger size is gonna increase your odds of winning a fight. And loons undergo contests and battles. And many of us who've observed loons in the field, oftentimes we'll see this in April or May where there's quite a penguin dancing going on on the surface, lots of threats and peering. And it seems like there's a battle or a contest that's taking place. And unlike humans in the animal world, body size usually means you're going to win the contest. And usually a resident is gonna win because their motivation is higher to stay. So that's what we see with loons. So now we address size, small body size, long distance migrant, larger size, because selection's pushing you to get larger because you're more likely to win. Oh, and by the way, let me tell you just real briefly here, I was out with Dave Evers over a decade ago and we caught a male that was 7,600 grams. So to give you an idea, that's about a 16 pound loon, which is just massive. It's like the size of a big Canada goose or larger than that. So now we might wanna ask ourselves, why are loon wings so narrow? So here's the loon that spread its wings and we look at it, they seem to be fairly long for its size, but they're narrow, those secondaries are narrow. So why is that? And so you're looking at us taking pictures and gathering data on the top right-hand corner. 99% of the time, loons are in the water. And the wings are oppressed to the body, folded in to minimize drag and resistance in the water. So if the wing was wider, right, it would create turbulence for the water because it would stick out from the body. It wouldn't be smooth like the Toyota Prius, right? It would look like the Hummer. So... Loons have narrow wings because they're diving birds. They're catching fish. They have to be better at catching fish than fish are avoiding them. And so they need to be streamlined. And this is what we see, for example, right here. So those narrow wings are awesome for a diving bird, but there's a trade-off, which is now I need to get lift, right? So I'm reading a book, you know, by the brothers, uh, you know, trying to first discover flight, for example, and here we are trying to achieve lift is very challenging. So most of us recognize loons have some of the heaviest wing loading values and they need a long runway then to get off, to get up into the air. So that's my approach in the book. Uh, and I just, before I end up here, I just wanna thank just a few people in particular. This list can be extensive. 
Darwin Long, Hannah Ewercook, Brooks Wade, Jay Mager, Dave Evers, uh, many researchers, principal investigators, assistants that I've had that were just a treat to work with them. I've worked with 248 volunteers. And these are people who stayed with me for probably five days in the field. So you can imagine the other volunteers who would be work with, work with me for a day or two, that number would blo uh, blossom. And I've worked with 52 biologists. And these are biologists that worked with me for two days or more, right? And that number is extensive. And I've been funded primarily by Earthwatch Institute, which is based in Boston, which I've been extremely grateful for, and Biodiversity Research Institute as well. And of course, any researcher is away from home oftentimes, and you need a supportive family, or it certainly helps to have a supportive family. A uh, picture of my wife and my daughters, who've always been very supportive of my constantly leaving home. And it's great to see them when I return. Okay, so that's all I had. Thank you for tuning in and to the Loon for its inspiration. And of these folks, most of the pho photographs came from them. Okay, thank you. Great, so Jim, we do have some questions in the chat and um, I encourage folks, if you have questions that you haven't put in there yet, um, please do add them. We're gonna go right up until eight o'clock. We'll cut it off at eight. So hopefully we'll get through all of these questions, but if you want a better chance of your question being asked, you should ask sooner rather than later. <laughs> um, so our first question is from Ian Johnson, who coincidentally, it seems like uh, you might know him because he says that he and Cassie say hi. Um, and his question is, what are, what are the trends in turbidity in the Gulf? Historically, is it less or greater than it has been? And depending on the answer, he's wondering what that means for overwintering needs going forward. Yeah, great question. Ian, everybody, awesome. It's, Ian was a former student and uh, we can tell stories, but Ian, great catching up with you sometime. Uh, I'm not as up to date on some of the turbidity measurements in the Gulf of Mexico. I have not looked at that historically. So that would be a great uh, question and investigation is how much has turbidity changed? We know where I was doing the study, for example, I didn't get a chance to explain this, but I was near the mouth of the Mississippi River. So I was probably, probably 10, about, up to about 10, 10 to 20 miles away, for example. And that Mississippi being the large river that it is, there's quite a bit of turbidity that extends out. And I don't know how that much that has changed over time and how much that would have influenced loon behavior, but potentially it could. And all I can say is that's a great question. Um, we've got another question from Ian. Are there records of such large feeding flocks in clear water? Um, is, and is that group foraging a strategy specifically for fishing in turbid water? Yes. So the... Flock foraging is fairly common, for example, on some large lakes. So Lake Michigan, uh, Lake Huron, I've seen rafts of 40, 50, 60 birds, for example. So I think as long as the fish are schooling and they're of the right size and they're small loons, especially during migration, will form large flocks. There's some, for example, some large lakes in Minnesota that Ian, you might even be aware of, where researchers have seen 100 and 150 loons, for example, flock feeding during September. So they have that ability to conduct that group behavior during the fall. And in the winter, we see that as well. I have seen that in clear bodies, clear water as well in the ocean. So six to eight miles out from the open ocean, I've seen groups foraging as well as nearby as well. I have a question from Gail H and I had the same question. Uh, how the heck are you able to catch those loons in the winter or you know, not on their breeding grounds when they have no chicks? Um, and Gail has added a little bit more information, which is that she's interested because she's aware of an injured loon in Minnesota um, that they've been trying to catch and it doesn't have chicks and they just haven't had luck. So that's sort of where her question is coming from. Um, so as a researcher, I, I have reached a certain level of frustration after all these years of trying to catch loons in the winter time. It is extraordinarily challenging and I don't know Sometimes if the ratio of effort to success sometimes pays off, for example. So I could be out all night, attempt to catch 10 loons and, and be unsuccessful. And then what we do is you get back, you try again the next day. Uh, there seems to be a little bit of luck involved. Like sometimes we'll just come upon a loon 
one, two, three, it's fast. So we'll be out two, three miles in the ocean and we're just scanning, looking for a loon. And then, and then all of a sudden we can't find anything. And there'd be a loon that maybe came up next to the boat. And all of a sudden you scoop it and you catch it. So oftentimes we were opportunistic. We tried calling loons to keep them on the surface. So the listeners are aware that loons respond to other vocalizations by other members. So whale calls, tremolo calls, and sometimes we can keep a loon in the winter a little close to the surface, but even then we haven't been very successful. So it's a lot of effort, it's a lot of hard work. And in terms of catching the breeding bird in Minnesota or the non-breeding bird, but uh, in the summer, I know it's extraordinarily challenging. Uh, we've tried to catch some loons, for example, that have monofilament wrapped around them. And it's just challenging if they don't have young to just keep them on the surface. And I wish I could give you some great advice, a great tip that says this always works, but it is, it remains challenging. Um, we have a question about those sternal punctures in Mark Poker's study. Um, and it's, so those, the, the, that it was found in half of loons. Is that half of all dead loons? Is that half of loons that died specifically from the sternal puncture or um, are they able to survive some of these pokes? Yes, great questions. Um, it seems that the ones that Mark has done necropsies on and has looked at the breastplate, so roughly half of the loons have had them. So it's a fairly large subset. And the last question in terms of, in terms of have they caused death? On a few occasions, absolutely. I think the loons can die from sternal punctures, but Mark was seeing lots of healing taking place. And so I suspect that most of the time they do not kill the individual outright. Uh, and that's probably more uncommon, but it certainly can happen, but they do seem to heal from them as well. Uh, question about loons in the fossil record. Are there um, sort of previous loon species? And if so, how do they differ from our current uh, common loon? Yeah, it's interesting that around 15 million years ago, the first maybe common ancestor of our modern day loon was seen in terms of just looking at the skeletal system. And prior to that, we do see some modification of the skeletal system. So the feet being moved further back, for example, so it could be a more successful diver, slightly larger body size as well. And I know the, the person didn't ask this question as well, but it seems like modern day loons just seems like within the last 2.6 million years have existed. So there's five species of loons, red-throated, yellow-billed, Pacific, and Arctic loon. And it seems that our fossil record gets us back to about 2.6 million years ago, where we can find the exact replicas of modern day loons as well, if that helps. And then some genetic tools looking at molecular biology, sequencing the DNA and other proteins. It seems like the loon's closest relatives are penguins, and they probably shared a common ancestor with penguins, you know, over or approximately 50 million years ago. So loons have kind of been on their own trajectory for a long time, but it seems that they might have a long lineage. And loons, for example, have kind of fluctuated. We thought they were ancient birds, then maybe more modern birds, and now the pendulum, as we gather more data, is push, pushing it back. Maybe they do have an ancient lineage. Uh, question about body size. Um, is food quality related to body size? I'm thinking about the presence of trout in lake systems in New England versus more or less absence of those in the Midwestern lakes. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about that. That hasn't been investigated. So it's an interesting thought as well. I think from my observations, loons are opportunistic in what they forage on. And they're going to feed until they get enough caloric content to meet their needs. So if if prey type, I don't know that prey type would matter as much, but it's certainly something to consider just maybe potentially to put on fat prior to migration. I think there might be some selection in terms of fish versus invertebrates to potentially get more oils to put on fat prior to migration. That would be something that would be curious to investigate. But overall, I don't know that diet specifically in terms of prey type will affect body size mass that much. Um, there's a question about a loon that was off of Cape Cod this past winter. 
all winter long. Um, and they're just wondering, is that an unusual place for a loon to be given that you were studying loons in the Gulf? Or um, can you talk a little bit more about wintering grounds and where certain loons go? Yes, and it would be nice to, if I showed a range map, but I, I do in the book. So, and, uh, and what we find is along both North American coastlines. So all the way from Labrador, Nova Scotia, of course, to the tip of the Floridian Peninsula, around the Gulf, to the Yucatan Peninsula, Baja Peninsula, Southern California, all the way up to Alaska. So loons winter in all those marine coastal waters. And literally 95, 96% or more loons all winter in the oceans. We are finding some loons that for the last 20, 30, 40 years, are remaining on freshwater reservoirs in both the Southwest and in the Southeast. So these loons are not going to the ocean. And as long as these reservoirs have enough food, pray for them, they're no longer going to the ocean, which is kind of an interesting thing. So a loon off Cape Cod wouldn't be as uh, atypical or unusual. Actually, Cape Cod is one of the densest places to find wintering loons. So there's quite a bit of prey available to loons. And so Cape Cod's like a, one of the most, one, a very ideal spot to find loons. And something I'll share with, the, with everybody as well, we put satellite transmitters and loons in Maine. And some of these loons that were breeding up in the Rangeley Lakes area, some of them went just north of Cape Cod and a few went just south of Cape Cod. And we put transmitters in a pair of loons that successfully fledged young and the male and female were separated by over 600 miles between the north and the south. So the male stayed along the coast of Maine and the female went south of Cape Cod just a bit, just to give you perspective and idea. So this showed us, and what we've always felt, is that males and females, the same pair, winter in different locations. Um, so you've done so much research in so many different places and there's a, a question uh, asking, are you doing anything now? And if you are, can you um, talk a little bit about your current research? Sure, great question. Is I spent quite a bit of time on the book. And so then some of my research kind of took, took a back seat, as you can imagine, as I was trying to get this done. It's really hard to balance everything, as you can imagine, in terms of research, teaching, and writing. And it's very challenging. And uh, not just to kind of show you kind of what I had to do is oftentimes I would get up at 4, 4.30 every morning, and I would write for two hours. And I literally needed to do that because of other teaching loads, constraints. I just couldn't find the time to do it. So in terms of the research that I'm conducting now, I'm really looking at winter behavior near river mouths and bays and coves in loons in the ocean. And what we're finding so far is that along river mouths, we're finding more flock foraging, more group of loons, and in bays and coves, more solitary loons. And we're also starting to think that there seems to be a dominance hierarchy in loons and feeding. So we're, most of us are aware of chickens with their hierarchy showing their dominance and aggressiveness towards each other. And I don't know that it's quite as complicated as what we find in chickens, but I do think a little bit what we've observed, there seems to be maybe some hierarchy that an adult, either male or female, is going to forage along the coast first. And usually I'll find a subadult will then follow. But it's never the subadult first. It's always an adult that follows, uh, precedes a subadult. Um, lots of compliments on the presentation and from people who have already read, read the book on the book itself. Um, there is a question about where people can buy it. What's the best uh, you know, website or wherever they can go to to order your book? Sure. Thank you for asking and appreciate the thoughts on the, on the book. Uh, I was really hope writing the book for folks like yourselves. Uh, it's kind of, I might get kind of pretty weird. We're all like COVID, all a little emotional. But just a labor of love. And it really warms me to know that people are enjoying the book and learning from it. I had a couple in, in Washington in their 70s told me they're reading the book to each other, you know, like in bed. And I just thought, like, how cool is that? So I'm glad people are enjoying the book. And uh, thank you for the kind words about the presentation. So University of Minnesota website, if you just went to University of Minnesota Press website, you, you can find the book there very easily. 
obviously there's always the large distributors, Barnes and Noble and Amazon, but some local bookstores will have it as well. And when, you know, we hear buy local when you can, which I certainly would support that, but uh, it's not as common in all local bookstores. I think there's a time for that to happen. The book was released June 29th. So we're still early in this kind of infancy. It might get there, but University of Minnesota website would be an ideal place to find it. And if you're in New Hampshire, you can drop by the Loon Center. We do have it. Hey, thank you. I should have plugged that one. <laughs> and I, I think it's on our online store as well. So if you wanted to uh, stop by loon.org and go to our shop, uh, it should be in there. Great. Thank you, Caroline. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you to everyone who tuned in tonight. Um, and I just want to uh, send out a reminder that LPC's annual meeting and our final summer nature talk is occurring next Thursday at 7 p.m. That will be um, a summary of what happened in New Hampshire this past year in terms of how many loons we had, how many chicks we had, and, and a lot of other good information. So if you're interested in learning more about that, please do join us next Thursday at 7 p.m. Uh, same place on our YouTube channel. Awesome. And have a great night, everyone. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care.